Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with sports scientist at the Seattle Seahawks, Patrick Ward. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to episode 33 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today, really, really excited to get on uh, Patrick Ward, who is a sports scientist at the Seattle Seahawks. So as I mentioned in the episode, I think it's the third person coming from Seattle, so we've definitely got a little team team together. So I'm hoping to hook up with these guys when I go over to the conference in, in June, which I'm absolutely buzzing about. So in this episode, Patrick talks about his coaching philosophy and although not strictly a coach um, he talks about how his coaching philosophy still dictates um, a large part of how he goes about things he also talks about his physiological buffer zone which he talks about on his on his blog um, optimumsportsperformance.com which is really really interesting he also discusses HIV, what it is, how can it, how it can be used, and its limitations. Obviously, as in his job as a sports scientist, there's a lot of data collecting. So we talk about um, profiling, program design, and monitoring fatigue. It's a really, really interesting chat with Patrick. I'm sure you'll get loads out of it. So if you haven't seen already, the new Pacey Performance site is up which gives you uh, better access to listening to the podcast so you can listen on the internet or on the site itself you can listen on itunes you can listen on the uh, on youtube as always so if you want to check that out go to paceyperformance.co.uk there's also a couple of other pages on there so you can go over to the resources there is a page dedicated to the podcast and a blog which i'm going to be increasing the amount of of time that i put into that as well if you've got any feedback on any of the episodes of the podcast, please feel free to comment on on the podcast pet on the um, individual episode page. There's a little section at the bottom, and you can post your comment. If you do want to post your comment and guide it towards the person who has been on the on the podcast that episode, so in this case, Patrick Ward, I'll make sure Patrick is aware of the question you had, uh, and I'll get him to pop on and answer your questions. So just one last thing before I let you go, I'm involved with the organization of a a seminar. So it's the South Yorkshire Performance Seminar, which will be going on at Sheffield United's Academy and will be taking place on the 1st of July from 6 till 9.30. And there's three speakers on the evening, which is Ross Burberry, who has featured a couple of times on the show, who is Head of Sports Science and Research in Nottingham Forest. We've got Luke Jenkinson, who is Lead Academy SNC coach at Sheffield United. And we've got Paul Bauer, who is Head of Academy Sports Science at Barnsley FC. So Ross is going to discuss developing explosive power safely in football. Luke is going to look at role of play and multi-sports to, to athlete development. And Paul, very enthusiastically, will be discussing realities of developing players on a budget. So I will put the link to the to do a seminar uh, on the on the show notes so if you are interested just jump over to the to the link uh click on there it's going to be 20 pound for the evening which involves three and a half hours of of the seminar plus plenty of time to uh to mingle and mix with some like-minded people so get involved in that be a great evening and before i go any more here is the interview with patrick ward Hi guys, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Really excited to get, I think, my third guy on from Seattle in Patrick Ward. So this interview came about after speaking with Dean Riddle a couple of weeks ago, and I was asking about the staff that he's got down there, and he mentioned um, mentioned Patrick and said, you want to you wanna get him on, although he's been taking the piss out of me for the last couple of months after his podcast, um, you should get him on. So just to welcome Patrick to the podcast, and ask him to give us a little bit of information about his background and education. So welcome to the podcast, Patrick. Hey, Rob. uh, Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's great to be here and share some ideas with you. It's going to be tough to fill the shoes of one Dean Riddle, but uh, but, uh, (laughs) I'll try my best. Um, 
I got a little bit, a little bit of background on me. Let's see. Uh, my education was in uh, exercise science, probably like most people in the uh, in the field. And um, I started out in Phoenix, where I had my own facility. I did. Well, actually, I started out in New York City, tracking back before that for about five years, just as a trainer in a gym. Uh, when I moved to Phoenix in 2006. I opened my own facility and uh, mainly serviced athletes, either amateur or professional, um, or even recreational, like uh, endurance athletes a lot, cycling and and things like that. Um, I spent six years there, and in 2012, I went to Nike, where I spent time uh, in the sports research lab, um, working under a a guy, Ian Muir, who's a, a physiologist, and um, it was a really great experience for me just in terms of uh, delving more into data collection and, and stuff like that, um, and I also got to work with another really good strength coach there, Keith D'Amelio, so uh, when we weren't doing projects around professional athletes and um, uh, data collection and, and research projects around professional athletes or teams, uh, Keith and I were training some of the off-season NFL and NBA athletes. Um, so I spent two years there, and then from there, I came up to the Seattle Seahawks this past season, so uh, the 2014 season, and started up here um, right around uh, July. So uh, almost a, a year, probably, I guess, what is that, about uh, 10 or 12 months now, uh, or no, eight or nine months now that I've been up here. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of where that brings my travels today. Cool. So what's your official role at Seahawks? Yeah, uh, I work inside of the uh, the sports science department. Um, so we have a strength conditioning staff, we have an athletic training staff, and then, uh, and then we have a sports science department. And uh, we report directly up to our um, director of player health and performance. And he kind of oversees those three departments and is the main uh, uh, go-to person for the GM and the coach and the coaching staff, a guy called Sam Ramsden. Um, my main role within the sports science department is to handle the analytics. So um, I deal with the analysis of data that we collect, um, sometimes data that the scouts collect, and uh, the evaluation of that, creating reports, and um, trying to understand our players on a deeper level and, and producing interpretation of that analysis uh, for some of the key stakeholders within the building. So um, coaching and scouting and athletic training and strength and conditioning. Mm-hmm. So as, as we talked about before, I don't think Dean has got the grasp of NFL, but how is your He's transition? Learning. He's, He's learning. learning. He's learning. Yeah, yeah give him some credit. Um, yeah. So how was your transition coming from Nike um, into such a big um, enterprise like the uh, like the NFL? Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know, like like anything, there's there's a lot of similarities, and and you know, Nike in itself is a big enterprise. Of course, <laughs> of course. Oh, yeah, that. totally, yeah, totally. You know, it's, it's massive. I mean, even though I guess you, yeah, we're employees of the NFL we see such a small subset of that being with one team. So, um, you know, it's just, a, it's just a little bit different. I mean, the, the days are a little bit different. Um, what we do is a little bit more focused where at Nike, we might've been focused on multiple different sports, multiple different athletes. We might be working with soccer athletes and track athletes and football and basketball and all kinds of different things. And, um, now it's just very, uh, you know, very concentrated and specific towards football and, um, uh, we, you know, the day to day is, is, uh, is pretty routine because of that, but, uh, but it's really cool. It's all good stuff and we, and we get to do a lot of fun stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, I enjoy it. I mean, it's, you know, you know, maybe for, for you over in the UK or, um, you know, people who are in Australia, um, the idea of sports science, um, you know, and, and using science and to, to monitor, evaluate athletes, to plan training and things like that. Um, it, it's relatively new, uh, in North America, unfortunately, it's starting to gain some legs. So, um, we really get to kind of write, write our own bill in terms of, um, these are the things that are important and this is how we're going to look at them. And, uh, this is how we grow each year and continue the iterative process. Mm-hmm. That sounds interesting. So obviously Dean's within that department as well. 
Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I'm quite cautious in asking you about the kind of things that you're doing at the Seahawks because of obvious reasons. Yeah. But to to what extent are you kind of delving into, um, like you say, about what's important in the in the process of recruiting players, monitoring players? Um, kind of what depth are you going to 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 get that information? Yeah, I mean, we have a number of different data streams that we collect. Um, you know, things like uh, uh, sleep data and, and uh, wellness data, training load data, GPS, heart rate. You know, all the all the things that people tend to tend to collect these days, right? Uh-huh. I mean, none none of that stuff is you know, none of that stuff is really special. Um, I think, you know, the analysis and, and how you use it or what you do with it, uh, and probably more importantly, how you turn it into action, you know, those are, those are the important things. I think a lot of times people get swept away with the technologies and, um, you know, kind of what can I buy and, and thinking that the technology solves the problem. And that's not really true, right? People, people solve problems. Technology doesn't solve problems. It just gives you information. Um, and part of that is, I think people forget the first step in the process. I think they jump right to step two, which is what technology can I buy? But step one is really, uh, you know, start with a question. Uh, a lot of times people email me, you know, and say, oh, we're thinking about getting GPS for our team or whatever. What do you think? And my reply is always, I don't know what to think because I don't know what your question is. Like, I'm not sure what you're trying to understand with your players, right? So if I start with a question, um, then I then I can figure out what are the data streams that are going to help me answer that question. And then from there, I can figure out what's the analysis that will help me utilize the incoming data. And then from that analysis, I can you know, gain insights and create an interpretation that tells a story or paints a meaningful picture to the stakeholders within the building so that we can hopefully turn it into action. Mm-hmm. So when you came to the Seahawks, what kind of things were up and running at that time? And what, yeah. were the, what were the questions that you asked that presented themselves to um, find a solution in all them in all them streams that you mentioned? Well, uh, the year prior to myself and Dean heading there, uh, the team was already going down this route. So um, they were dabbling in things like GPS, and um, uh, Dean was working for a um, uh, a company that does like a you know, sort of like da- athlete management platform, like dashboard type of stuff at the time. So, um, uh, you know, he was kind of working with them to set that up um, prior to, to going there as an employee. And, um, you know, so I think, you know, like most teams, they're starting, they were kind of coming around to the fact that, wow, this could be really important. Uh, this is interesting stuff. And, I, that, you know, that's always great to have that revelation. Um, I think when I got there, the main thing for me was sort of this idea of uh, how how can we put some really good analysis around this to tell some interesting stories. I think a lot of times, you know, with teams, especially in North America, the the role of doing this stuff tends to fall on the lap of an assistant strength coach um, who might not be an analyst, who might not have any interest in really doing that. And so they rely on just stock reports that come out of those systems, you know, the, the stock GPS reports that whatever the company set up for you on your desktop, that's what you're going to get. Or the stock reports that come out of these dashboards on wellness things and stuff like that. Um, and, and those things can be OK, and uh, but they don't answer really interesting questions. And so to me, the analysis is what's important because that allows us to delve deeper into things and hopefully turn things into more actionable information. Like, you know, if you look at a stock GPS report that might come out in the system, well, how much high speed running did he do? Like, wow, this guy did a lot more than the rest of the team. Okay, that's great. But what's actionable about that? I mean, you go to the coach and you say, this guy did a lot of running. Well, how are we going to address that and change things for the practice next day for this guy? Or perhaps taking the analysis further and at the end of the season, looking back and doing some deeper analysis and being able to say, you know what, when you average above this threshold for a certain period of time, your risk of injury is X or the probability of a non-contact soft tissue injury is X. Um, So that to me is the, the interesting part is figuring out what the data can tell us so that we can turn it into something that's um, usable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's something I spoke to, like I say, I mentioned a couple of times now, I spoke to Dean a couple of weeks ago and he was mentioning that you were going through the data from 
obviously last last season. Yeah. So so how much how much reflection is there on last season? How much does that influence next season and the season after and the season after? Yeah, uh, like I said earlier, it's really an iterative process, you know. And um, uh, so this this previous season, the the data analysis was extensive. I mean, I did a lot of stuff. I spent a lot of time doing it and uh, put together a rather lengthy presentation that allowed us to have some really good discussions and um, come up with solutions on where some of the uh, bottlenecks are and uh, where we can try and improve things for next season. Um, not just improve things in terms of how we try and get data or try and get analysis or interpretation out and influence the athlete, but also in terms of uh, me just learning some things from our data and saying, wow, I didn't really know this before, but I need to create some analysis around this going forward because this is important information that we need to have every week. So um, it's pretty extensive. And, uh, you know, each year, I think you try and just build a little bit on the last. And again, you know, I think that's what people don't tend to do is they um, they just keep purchasing more technology. And, uh, you know, if they had heart rate last year, they want to get GPS this year, they want to get um, force plates the next year, they, they just keep adding more stuff and more stuff means more data. Um, but if you don't take the time to understand what it is you have already, um, sometimes you're missing stuff, you can't see the forest uh, through the trees. And, and, and what happens is um, you end up, I mean, the way that I say it is, a lot of times the stuff that we collect that's really, really impactful is stuff that's actually doesn't need technology. It's like free stuff, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, as long as you analyze it well and you understand what it means, um, there's a lot of complexity within the simplicity of things like that. So I think that's really powerful is taking the time to understand what it is you have before trying to add more stuff onto what it is you have. Mm -hmm. And sometimes building may mean taking something away. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's addition by subtraction, you yeah. know. Um, uh, I, there was one point in the middle of the season where I was producing different kinds of graphs and charts. And, you know, one there's like two of the charts that I was like, yeah, I, I just don't like these. Like, I don't think they're actionable. I don't think people really grasp them. So I just was like, I did a bit of a social experiment and I said, uh, I'm just going to stop making these and see what happens. <laughs> and uh, so I stopped and um, – and it, it, it took about two weeks before uh, someone realized, like, hey, where's that one chart? And it was Dean who, who – who, he was the one that picked it up. Toss, nobody nobody knew. <laughs> yeah, of course. He, you know, he's old, but he's still struck. <laughs> and, uh, and so, he, <laughs> so he, uh, he picked it up and he was like, hey, you stopped printing that one chart. And, and I was like, I just don't think it's very good or helpful. And, uh, and so he's like, oh, okay. You know, but um, so I, I think you know, that's the thing is like – to me, I was like, you know what? I'm – printing up these other charts, but I really think this graph is more meaningful. People tend to discuss it more. So why don't I focus on putting a better assessment and evaluation into what's in this graph instead of doing these other things that I don't think are very usable for people. So addition by subtraction is totally right. Mm -hmm. So when Dean actually mentioned you, um, obviously knew of a Patrick Ward that was um, that had a blog on optimum sports performance, not realizing yeah. the two were the actual same people. Yeah. Um, so you, you wrote an article recently on your coaching philosophy and I know yeah. obviously in your role, you're not, you're not, um, strictly a strength coach, but obviously that coaching philosophy is still obviously extremely important to you. Can you give us a breakdown of your coaching philosophy? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not the strength coach, but, uh, the coaching philosophy, um, what I do now is really important to my coaching philosophy. Uh, so it's the idea of trying to improve an athlete's uh, physiological buffer zone, um, which basically like if you think of a buffer zone, it's an area between two points. So I would say the two points are, um, you know, athletic performance and output and, and high level performance and then injury or breakdown. And we can think about players or uh, athletes that we've worked with who have very small physiological buffer zone where it's like, you know, you train them one day for 45 minutes and the next day they come in and they're wrecked and they're like, dude, my knees are so sore. My lower back's on fire. And you're like, man, what the hell happened to this guy? And then we have guys that are like total juggernauts and they have this enormous physiological buffer zone where it's like, no matter what you throw at them, they tend to be able to just show up the next day and be ready to practice or train. Right. Um, if you, I think you interviewed a good friend of mine, David Tenney, and he Correct, talks about yeah. 
you know, anti-fragile and uh, from uh, the Nassim Tlaib's book, who's an economist who has this concept of anti-fragility, which is basically um, um, organisms or structures which succeed, not just succeed, but actually thrive amidst the chaos around them. And uh, and that's it, it's kind of the same concept. It's sort of the same concept. Um, and, and the way that you look at the physiological buffer zone, the way that you interpret it, uh, the way that you test it, evaluate it, and then train it to make it better is um, to – I took my coaching philosophy and I broke it down into sort of the three buckets that I think are really, really important. So stress or stress resistance, um, stress tolerance, uh, movement quality. So you know, can the individual move through the, the adequate joint ranges of motion for their sport? Um, you know, do they have the necessary um, joint ranges of motion? Can they move through three, you know, all three planes of motion effortlessly? Those kinds of things, and then fitness level. So, uh, general fitness and and special special fitness that's specific to their sport and sporting needs, etc. Um, and I can't say that any one of those three is more important than the other. Although, uh, when I draw it up, I do a triangle, and I tend to put stress resistance or stress tolerance at the top, uh, only because. You know, if your if your ability to resist or tolerate the stress being applied to you is uh, is poor, um, then you probably are not going to go out there with good fitness, and you're going to break down really fast. Or you're probably going to be stressed out and really stiff, and have you know inadequate joint range of motion and movement, and and break down. And so, I think stress resistance and stress tolerance are, you know, that's probably the most important. And and um, you know, within those three buckets, there's ways that you can monitor uh, and evaluate them. Uh, there's ways that you can train them, uh, test them, and and so, uh, and that's the important thing I think is is figuring out what are the things that are important to you. Those are the things that you know several years ago I wrote down that were important to me. Um, what I do now, in terms of my role as as sports science analyst, um, is really important to in my mind, in terms of thinking about that coaching philosophy, thinking about those three buckets and then saying to myself, okay, how do I test and monitor the red flags of each of those buckets so that I can understand where the athletes are at? So I'm kind of on that end rather than the training side of it, but uh, it's still very, very important to me. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think I said this to Dean and maybe he's quite he's quite offended because he obviously just joined the Seahawks when I uh, when I spoke to him, but if you were to get a uh, another pure kind of SNC role, how would how would your coaching philosophy would it have changed since this current role? Um, obviously, more focus on analytics. Yeah, I I don't think it would have. Uh, you know, I don't think it would have. You know, I don't think it would change. I mean, those are three pretty big rocks. Mm -hmm. You know, what what changes is maybe. The, the way that you yeah. evaluate, yeah, the way that you maybe train some things, but. Um, you know, I, I have a pretty th – those are three pretty big rocks, and, and those are what we use to uh, – uh, you know, what I would use to write programs for NFL guys when we were at Nike. Um, that's how we would evaluate the guys week in and week out, and, and um, uh, those, those are the concepts that really um, – that you know that we use to drive our program design and understanding of where the athletes were at. So I don't think it would change, um, but you know, just maybe the 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 way that you evaluate things and uh, monitor things might you know improve or um, get better over time as we learn more information. Mm -hmm. So so the creation of that philosophy, how did it? Was it you sat down at a desk thinking, okay, I uh, need a philosophy. Where do I start? I'm kind of got a pen and a paper. How did yeah. that? How did that come about? Was that how it went? Yeah. Well, I think you know, like back in probably, geez, back in like 2011, mm -hmm. maybe 2010, uh, something like that. Um, I was getting into like uh, heart rate variability and having people do questionnaires and things like that. When I had, you know, this was back when I had my own facility. So it's probably like. Yeah, like 2010, maybe 2009, 2010, something like that. And um, I was getting into that kind of stuff. And uh, and then I was working with some cyclists. So we had guys with power meters and things like that. So that kind of was the start of me being like, okay, wow, like we can collect information and objectively go about our business in terms of um, how we train, how we progress, where whether we progress or whether we hold steady because we don't think we're getting – what we want from our training and things like that. And, um, 
back at that time, I think 2009, I did a, a presentation for an NSCA conference in Arizona on heart rate variability. So just like a simple, like practical application. And, and, um, so that was really interesting because that spawned a bunch of other presentations where people were like, Hey, can you talk more about that or talk more about how you train and stuff like that? And then, um, it was probably, you know, I, the, the, the philosophy kind of grew out of that. And I was like, okay, these are the things that are important to me. And this is how I look at them. And then really penning it happened uh, probably two years ago. I was in New York City where I spoke for a day. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Charlie Weingroff, had me come out and speak to a group of trainers just on my whole approach. So it was like everything that I do in eight hours. And um, so that was when I really sat down and I was like, well, I know these things are important to me. How am I going to verbalize this or explain it to people? And so I wrote this, you know, it must have been like 300 some slides uh, presentation of just like a brain dump of like, this is what's important. This is what I've read to make me believe that it's important. This is what I've read to make me set up the systems and structures that I use to evaluate these things, to train them. This is how I go about it. This is how I write a, you know, a program. This is, you know, those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it didn't happen overnight, but, uh, you know, it's definitely a process that I think every strength coach should go through because you really start to figure out, um, what are the things that are important to you rather than jumping around to all different kind of con ed courses and different things. And, you know, people tend to say like, wow, you know, I used to do that 10 years ago and I totally forgot about it. And it's like, well, you know, if you write down what's important and how you, um, you know, how you service the things that are important, uh, I think you, you tend to not only have more consistency, but it also gives you a certain level of, uh, um, uh, you know, positive outcomes Anytime you work with someone, you have a system and then the only thing that changes is within that system, it's, it's a little bit malleable depending on the person. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's cool. So you touched on there um, about HIV and it's something that I wanted to kind of um, get into your brain about. Um, it's another thing that is, um, it, coming back to the analytics, it's another thing to, to think about and analyze and, and use, yeah. obviously, hopefully in a positive way. But can you just give us a bit of an overview on what it is and why you think it's important, if you do think it's important? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. It's, uh, heart rate variability is basically an evaluation of uh, the state of our autonomic nervous system uh, by looking at the... Um, sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. So uh, sympathetic uh, being like, uh, you know, fight, flight, you know, those kinds of things, parasympathetic, like rest and digest, right. Uh, in a very kind of gross, simplified way. Of course, you know, when people say that it makes it sound like they're sort of antagonists to each other, but they're not, they're actually synergists. They work together and there's always um, tone in the system or tone in the body from both of those systems. The only thing that really is going to change is, is, uh, the amount. So, you know, if, if I pulled you off your couch right now and had you go on a treadmill and start to run full tilt, um, you know, we're going to ramp up your sympathetic system because of the stress and your body trying to, uh, you know, mobilize energy and, and, uh, physiologically meet the demands of that stressor. Um, and then hopefully after the workout, we can sit you down on the couch and, get you into a state where you're back to relaxing and you kind of shut down and your body goes into a, uh, a recuperative state. And heart rate variability is a way to measure that, a, a non-invasive way to measure that. And um, it's it, if you think about like an EKG readout um, where you have your QRS wave, the R is the, the high kind of spike. And what heart rate variability is doing is looking at the uh, duration of time between RR intervals, so consecutive RR intervals. Um, and there's a number of ways to to do the math around this, uh, a number of different assessments or evaluations of this. Uh, some of it depends on the duration of the test that you're using. Um, but the, the shorter tests, the, the commercialized versions that are out, the shorter tests are anywhere from like a minute for some of them up to, up to maybe five minutes. Um, and you know, what you're looking for is basically a shift or a uh, yeah, sort of a shift in heart rate variability, a shift in tone, um, which would might indicate that the person's still operating under some level of fatigue and not completely ready to take on the next workout that you're about to, the next stress that you're about to apply to them. Since that's what we do, we apply stress and we ask the body to adapt. 
Um, and, and I've got a bunch of blogs, uh, you know, a bunch of articles in my blog about this. Um, so do I think it's important? Yes. The, it can be difficult to use in the, uh, in the, you know, the applied setting in the research lab. It tends to work out cause you can control a lot of things like show up at the lab at 7 AM after waking up, don't eat any food, don't drink any coffee. We're going to put you in this room. It's quiet. It's dark. It's always, uh, you know, whatever, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you know, something like that, where we, we can control all the settings. In the applied setting, it's it's a little more noisy. And heart rate data in general is relatively noisy. Um, but heart rate variability, it's, it's really no different, right? And so sometimes, you know, people want to apply heart rate variability in, in the, you know, in their gym setting. And the problem is like, we well, you've got people showing up at all different times of day. If I take your heart rate variability at five o'clock at night or four o'clock at night after a day's full of work and stress and you drove over there through rush hour traffic, um, you know, I might see this maybe overly sympathetic state, which is reflective of the day that you just went through, but not necessarily reflective of a negative training effect. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, and, and, and that's the, that's the hardest part. So, if you're going to use it, you really want to try and standardize an approach. Like what I would do is I would give the guys their own systems and uh, they would, you know, we, I would have a document written up that I wrote that would tell them how to do it every morning. They would wake up, you know, go to the bathroom, do their thing, hang out for a second, throw the, you know, wet the heart rate strap, throw it on, sit down, give themselves about a, you know, a minute or two to kind of wind down and then just push start and um, allow the thing to record. And then when they were done recording, it would just uh, be sent to me in a CSV file so I could look at it, evaluate it before they came into training. So while they were on their drive over. Um, and it's not a, uh, I think a lot of people, you know, the commercial models have these very nice, like green, yellow, red traffic lights and um, things like that. They're based on thresholds, which might not be specific to you or uh, the individuals you work with. So doing your own analysis is always really important to try and understand um, the individual's thresholds, to understand uh, the changes over time or the trends that are going on. You know, sometimes with some of the heart rate variability apps on the market, I've had really fit cyclists who are always in the green, but of course there's a threshold for being in the green. And so a negative for them might not be, might not be able to trigger a yellow or a red in the threshold for the individuals that the system was built off. But for a very, very fit cyclist with a, you know, resting heart rate of 42 beats per minute or, or 40 or 38 beats per minute, um, he might have totally different thresholds. So doing your own evaluation uh, and assessment of the, the data is always really, really important to understand the baseline and understand the individual you're working with, much like anything. Mm -hmm. So is there a, different in the, a difference in the, in the shorter tests compared to the, like the one minute compared to the five minute? Is there some sort of like reliability issue there? Yeah, I, I, uh, I tend, the shorter the test, I tend to get more concerned. Okay. Uh, there was one paper that looked at 60 second um, I'm going to try and remember off the top of my head what it was. It looked at 60 second testing periods, but what they did was they pulled like random 60 second periods out of a much longer analysis. Like it might have been during sleep, if I remember correctly. So they were taking nocturnal heart rate variability, and then they're basically showing, um, you know, these 60 seconds, or it might have been just upon waking or something, like 10 minutes upon waking. They're showing that, oh, you know, randomly pulled 60 seconds are relatively reliable, so a 60-second test is reliable. Um, but, I, you know, I tend to get more nervous the the uh, the shorter the test. So I, I tend to err towards the things that are more like three to five minutes. Um, one of the systems that we used at Nike was a sleep monitoring system where the guys would wear a heart rate strap and we would actually get nocturnal heart rate variability that way. So we would get it while they sleep. And, uh, and I found that to be pretty interesting as well. Okay. So what can you, uh, name the, the company that you use for that? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's still around. It was called sleep rate. Um, that was the company that we used. And, uh, I think they're out of San Francisco, California, right? If I remember correctly. And, and I, I, I believe they're still around. I believe they're still, uh, Still operating. Okay, so what so what system are you using at the uh, at the Seahawks? 
at the Seahawks, we use what's called a ready band from a company named Fatigue Science from Vancouver, British Columbia, in Canada. Uh, and that's um, actigraphy. So it's a watch, and it's basically measuring uh, uh, wrist movement, right? So, um, you know, how much you move your wrist, you know, back and forth or across your body uh, during sleep. And they correlate actigraphy wrist movement to body movement to being awake. So they've done some studies um, evaluating actigraphy against capnography, which is, uh, you know, one of the gold standards in terms of sleep research and evaluation. Uh, and basically just kind of trying to understand how much movement yields an awakening or an arousal where you might be up for two or three seconds, you know, so maybe like a guy who has uh, sleep apnea where he might have like these, you know, 50 or 60 awakenings in a night where he's like, cause he's stopping, you know, stops sleeping, basically he's snoring, snoring and stops breathing. And then he kind of, you know, gags himself and <laughs> moves and rolls over and, and then does that, you know, 50 sometimes a night, obviously that's very disordered sleep. That's not good. So, um, so the actigraphy can pick up the movement of the body. And then from there, um, you make a determination on the quality of sleep. Mm -hmm. So, so someone take that, take that example. Um, that you just mentioned. How would you go about creating intervention for that for that person? What kind of things are you are you looking at for your yeah. guys? Something like that, um, uh, where you know when you start to see really wild amounts of uh, of uh, awakenings, you know something like that. You're you're referring them out to a sleep specialist for a study because you're you're hypothesizing that they probably have uh, a um, uh, like a sleep apnea problem and they're going to need a CPAP machine or something to help them breathe at night. So, so that, you know, that, that's like a pretty serious case. I mean, the intervention there is pretty easy. You know, someone who sleeps five hours a night and it's not very good sleep. It's like, you know, interventions are pretty much, I mean, you know, I can't go to their house and read them a book to go to bed. So, <laughs> you know, they'd like that. Warm, they'd like that. Warm milk or something, <laughs> you know, so, um, so interventions are more centered around education. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, turn off the, you know, turn off your cell phone and your iPad when you lie down to bed, no TV, make the room dark, you know, cave like, you know, try and uh, set up a good sleep schedule so that you can get at least eight hours of sleep and, and things like that. And so, you know, we produce some educational, I mean, I mean you know, Dean, Dean produces some of the educational uh, resources for the players around that kind of stuff. So yeah. So is he is he presenting to them? How is he getting that information across to the to the guys? Yeah, it's provided to the guys in a digital format. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, but the, so and then and then from there, you know, analysis into like sleep and injuries, um, time series analysis types of things where you know uh, if you have one poor night of sleep, how many more nights poor nights of sleep are you probably you know potentially going to have in a row. So, you know, how much does one poor night of sleep derail you, right? Things like that. Um, those are kind of part of my back end of it is like trying to understand what are the potential ramifications. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you do any sort of, um, are you allowed to do any sort of uh, research, kind of publishable research um, in the NFL? Um, we, you know, there's some studies that are, kind of done in the NFL, a lot of it's anthropometric type of stuff, but, um, you know, a goal going forward would be to evaluate, uh, um, evaluate these things more specifically and, tr and try and produce something, um, that's meaningful or adds to the body of the current body of literature that's already out there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Well, I've kept you 35 minutes, but I just want to talk to you about, um, yeah. optimum sports performance.com. How did yeah. that come about? What's the kind of vision for it? Um, what's it about? Yeah, uh, that was my company when I was in Phoenix, and uh, it actually started as a blog. Um, and mainly, I mean, it's a, it's it's kind of an interesting, I guess. Uh, it's been an interesting journey. It's been about six years, maybe six, seven years, I think, since I've been writing it since whatever two thousand six. Um, so. I started it out just as like a way to sort of pen my ideas. Like this is what I'm reading. These are the things that interest me. Um, so it's kind of evolved, you know, like 
the first few years are more like general training stuff. And then it was like more very sport esque type stuff. Then as I got into like soft tissue work, it was very like massage based and hands on therapy based. And then, and how that bleeds into training and recovery. And then it got into like a lot of the monitoring stuff. Like I said, articles on heart rate variability and questionnaires and things like that. And, and, uh, and now, you know, I've written some articles on data analysis and, um, you know, I have a few more kind of coming up that I'm going to probably write once the NBA season wraps up here on the, uh, on the 14th of April. Um, just cause I, I like doing some of the stats and evaluation around things like basketball and baseball. Um, so it's, it's kind of like been this evolution of all the things that I've been interested along the way. Uh, and it's, so it's been really fun in that regard. It's a little bit different than most blogs where, um, you know, most blogs in the industry are written as a method of business kind of drumming up business, right? Yeah, like, course, yeah. how do you know, how do I get more client, you know, come train with me, get more clients type of stuff like that. So uh, my blog is more written as like my own ideas, just kind of putting them out there for colleagues to discuss or disagree with, or, you know, those kinds of things. So I'm, I mean, my wife tells me it's like the worst blog ever because the only people <laughs> that read it are like me and five other people um, because nobody else is interested. But um, I think it's, it's good. I think it's quite fun. Uh, so that was the name of my company as well in Phoenix. And then, uh, you know, obviously when I went to Nike, I, I didn't do anything with my company anymore, but I kept the blog because I figured, yeah, you know, I'll still write some ideas and, and every now and again. So, um, so it's still there and I still write for it. I, although I write a lot less these days only because I feel like I've written about so much stuff that I'm like, man, how am I going to write more without rehashing what I've already talked about? So maybe if people have like, you know, things they want to hear about, they can email me and I can try and drum up a blog that, uh, Nice. Uh, gives you gives you at least my ideas on that stuff because I have I have, I have like terrible writer's block. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, your you, your wife didn't know that I read it, so that's six at least. There you go. Yeah, that's six at least. And it's international, which makes it even better. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now we're now we're creating a business out of it. You're going to get clients. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so where can apart from um, Optimum Sports Performance, where can people keep up to date with what you've got going on? Yeah, Optimum Sports Performance on Twitter. It's um, I think it's o at OSP Patrick. Uh, uh, you know, I've I have a Facebook account. Uh, so the, you know, the basic social media yeah. uh, streams um, I utilize, and uh, and people can always get in touch with me through through the blog. There's a uh, my email address is there. It comes right to me to my phone. So um, you know, I, I I try and answer every single email. Uh, so, but, but that being said, um, you know, timeliness sometimes is difficult just because I got a billion other things going on. So, uh, you know, if people, you have questions or email in, just kind of be patient, but I'll eventually get to you. I promise. Cool. Well, thank you yeah. for, um, thank you for answering my email, by the way, and giving up 45 minutes of your time to, to speak on here. So really Absolutely. Pre- thanks for having me. No problem, mate. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah. and thank you again. And I will, um, I'll speak to you shortly. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Okay, mate. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for tuning in to episode 33 of the Pace Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Patrick. Just before we go, just want to draw your attention to the new site, the new Pace Performance site, which is paceperformance.co.uk. You can keep up to date with all that's going on in the podcast on there. Keep checking out over the next couple of weeks because we've got some great guests on and I will see you in episode 34.